reality show, bringing you some of the highlights. And we're back again this week to pick out some of the stars of the show. BMW are well aware that the Geneva Motor Show is just awash with absolutely gorgeous looking roadsters. Every manufacturer seems to have one on their stand. And so they don't get left behind in it all, they've decided to update the James Bond favourite, their best seller, the Z3. And when it goes on sale in the UK in July, the changes to it will be very subtle. What you will get, BMW say, is a beefier looking package. BMW designers have added muscle all over the car. There's a restyled front grille, there are new wheels, and the entry-level model now has the larger flared wheel arches that the other models have. But the best news is here underneath the bonnet. The 1.9 entry-level engine from the old model has gone. It's been replaced instead by a brand new 2-litre, 150 brake horsepower version. Entry-level now is a 1.8. It's four cylinders and produces 118 brake horsepower. Throughout the rest of the range, the 2.8 remains the same, and right there at the top is the 3.2 litre Mighty M. Inside, things really aren't too different. There's a redesigned console that turns in with the upholstery and a new steering wheel. It still isn't as exciting as the interior of, say, the TT Roadster. So, there are changes to the Z3, so does that mean there'll be changes in price? Yes, they do, because the principal changes are under the bonnet where before we had a 1.9 litre um, 16 valve engine, we're moving to two engines. One's a two litre six cylinder, and the other is a 118 brake horsepower four cylinder engine. So in other words, we're splitting the existing entry car, one below in terms of power, and one above. So does that mean that one will be cheaper than the other entry level, and one will be a bit more expensive? You got it, Yay. exactly <laughs> right, we do. Although we haven't absolutely finalized prices, the, the new 1.8 litre Roadster, as it's been called, will be around the £20,000 mark, mm -hmm. whereas the 2-litre six-cylinder one will be more expensive than the 1.9, at something like uh, £23,900. Is it, am I right in thinking it's roughly two years since the Z3 first went on sale in the two UK? Years in, two years in Britain, right? but uh, actually three years, three over, over three, three and a half years since it first appeared in America. Right, because my, my next question was going to be that it really is, I mean, BMW have this sort of tradition of you don't update models that regularly, you do sort of keep things the same for four or five years, yet this seems to be quite a quick facelift on the Z3, why is that? Well, three and a half years is midlife for a normal car, and in, you're right in saying that BMW doesn't normally do uh, upgrades, midterm upgrades, uh, we do little detail things, um, normally little tweaks on styling, little change to the kidney grill at the front. In this case, as you see, we've got a little bit of a different back on the car, just ever so marginally changed, the new rear lights and so on. But it is actually mid-term with the car, and we think with the Roadster market, it's very much a market which brings up, um, but it's an exciting market, yeah. and things are changing quite fast in it. And it is a style market, so maybe it needs a little more of a change than we would normally do. You don't need me to tell you that the Octavia is a very important car for Skoda. It arrived in the UK last year and it's done incredibly well for them. That's partly because of the fact that it offers such good value and actually excellent build quality. It's based on the same platform as the A3 and the VW Golf. But also I think because of the fact that it's confidently styled, it's not apologetic, it looks purposeful. And the big news this year for the Skoda Octavia is that there's now a 4x4. I've got to confess, I'm a big fan of cars like this, 4x4 Estates. To me, it offers real versatility. It's a proper leisure time practical car. Far more so, if you think about it, than some of the enormous, great, cumbersome 4x4s that other manufacturers offer us all the time. Think of Subaru, think of Volvo and Audi. They've been doing this for years. A four-wheel drive estate makes an awful lot of sense. For Skoda with the Octavia, it's the first time they've ever done a 4x4. It's a whole new system derived from the Synchro. I'm sure it'll work, I'm sure it'll be practical, I'm sure it'll be rugged, and above all else, I'm sure it'll be cheap. It'll be available from launch with a direct injection 1.9 litre turbo diesel, and that'll be followed by a 2 litre petrol engine. They say that everything comes to he or she who waits, and that's certainly the case here on Aston Martin with the launch of the DB7 Vantage. It now has a 6 litre V12 all alloy 48 valve engine, which produces 420 
brake horsepower. This car will go on sale later this year. At the moment, DB7s start in price at £85,000. Expect this car to carry about a 25% premium on that price. It's been slightly, slightly restyled. It's slightly butcher and slightly meaner, but it's absolutely gorgeous. The new DB7 Vantage and DB7 Vantage Volante are powered by totally new 6 litre 420 horsepower V12 Aston Martin engines, which have been designed in close cooperation with the Ford Research and Vehicle Technology Group and Cosworth Technology, with some slight restyling by design guru Ian McCallum. You get a choice of body colours, including this distinctive almond green colour, which became one of the hallmarks of Sir David Brown's world famous Aston Martin Works Racing Team. Taking pride of place on Honda's stand is the sexy S2000, a car that has already been christened in terms of performance, the poor man's Boxster. Now this is a classic sports car, rear wheel drive, front engined, but the difference here is that Honda have positioned the engine behind the rear axle so that it's perfectly balanced. But of course there's more to a sports car's performance than where the engine is positioned. You need a great beast underneath there. So what is going to be lurking under the bonnet? It's a brand new uh, four-cylinder, normally aspirated two-litre engine. It's about 20 kilos lighter than any two-litre engine that we've produced in the past, so it's, it's all completely new. And it's producing uh, 250 PS uh, at uh, peak revs that are about 9,500 revs, so it's uh, literally like a motorbike engine. So it goes some then. It oh, really it goes. <laughs> it sure goes, yeah. A lot of people have likened it to a poor man's Boxster. How do you feel about things like that? Um, I guess I'd have to say lucky poor man. Really. <laughs> um, certainly Boxster is, is one of the cars that it'll compete against. Um, I'm quite happy that we let the car speak for itself dynamically and um, I know that it can more than hold its head up in that sort of company. Now it has very strong characteristics of its own, does it, behind the wheel? Because you're a man who's obviously driven it. Sure, sure. What's it like? Um, I think perhaps the word to sum it up would be it's, it, it's incredibly precise. Uh, very, very intense driving experience, which you would expect. But uh, the design concept set out from the basis of, for, for Honda's purpose, for our heritage, it literally should be a motorbike on four wheels. Motorbikes are very precise objects, every input gives you an output and that's the way the car performs so um, the whole driving experience of the car is, is very very race car like in its precision. Its weight distribution is nigh on perfect 50-50, uh, it's a rear wheel drive transaxle with a limited slip diff, six speed box and the new chassis that we've developed for the car because the whole thing's been produced from the ground up. It's no other platform, it's a, just the car by itself. That's a rarity today, isn't it? <laughs> it is, because most people are effectively putting very attractive bodies on shared platforms and inevitably that reaches a dynamic compromise. Um, we've not chosen to approach it this way, we weren't prepared to a compromise, so it's in incredibly rigid. Uh, as a body and its torsional rigidity for a soft top is quite staggering so you don't get any movement of the body uh, and that allows the suspension to work a lot better and that's what contributes to the to the sheer precision of the driving experience. In terms of the styling we do love our roadsters in Europe there's no doubt about that at all and um, has it been designed with the European market in mind? Has that been a specific objective to, to make something that has the style and the flair that we, we want really in Europe? Yeah, very much. Um, we would see, as a, as a global organisation, we would see Europe as very much the centre for car styling in any case, and certainly for a roadster. What the car had to do was we had to ensure that that appealed to European taste first, knowing that for this type of product, that would work in Japan, that would work in Asia, and indeed that would work in America. Now the crunch question, of course, is how much is it going to be and when will it be on sale? Um, well, it'll be on sale from September this year. Uh, if you haven't already got your order in, I'm afraid you have to wait a little bit longer because uh, we're about 12 months out on production at the moment with the orders that we've already taken. Um, and we are confident that the price will be below 30,000. So we're trying to 
make the sheer enjoyment accessible to as many people as we can. So if you notice it on the order books already, you've got 12 months to save at those pennies. And get the order in now. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thanks a lot. Subaru may well have invented the concept of the dedicated driver's car with the Impreza Turbo. Beloved, of course, of turbo nutters everywhere in all its various guises, and I doubt that will change. But in the UK, we're very soon, for the first time, going to get a far more sedate but still quite sporty option with the Legacy Saloon. I say sporty because they are pitching it very much as a sports saloon. Subaru say they see its natural competitors as BMW's 3 Series and Alpha's 156. And at the heart of the matter is that 2.5 litre flat 4 boxer engine and Subaru's all-wheel drive system. It's a familiar face, of course. You'll have seen it before on the front of the Legacy Estate that was recently upgraded and brought up to date. That's available, of course, in a sporting version, also with all-wheel drive, and in the Outback, which has an even more off-road slant. Absolutely gorgeous thing on any farm, anywhere. That 2.5-litre engine puts out 156 brake horsepower through the permanent all-wheel drive system and a four-speed automatic gearbox. It's difficult to say at this stage what specification we'll get in the UK, but expect it to be high. It'll probably have leather everywhere, there'll certainly be anti-lock braking, ventilated front discs, side airbags just about everywhere, and cruise control. We're back at home, practically the whole of the Manchester United football team seem to be driving Ferrari cars these days, but one Ferrari they haven't got their hands on yet is this, the new 360 Medina. What do you think of it? I think it's nice. However, one or two whispers have been heard here, it has a slightly Japanese sports car look to it. Not sure about that, but it is stunning. It replaces the 355. It has a 3.6 litre V8 engine. And Ferrari at the moment are having a real boom time. Sales are increasing across the world. And the famous prancing horse continues in success. Now, as you know, the platform on a new car takes up a large amount of manufacturers' resources and they like to get their money's worth. Just look at what the Volkswagen Group have done with sharing platforms and then what Renault have managed to create from the Megane format. So Toyota have got a lovely new car. They've got the Toyota Yaris. It's very cute. It's got a small platform. So who knows what they're going to do with that? Well, here to give us a clue is this, the Yaris Verso. Scott, Toyota have unveiled a bit of a strange looking thing here at the show, haven't they? What's it called? It's called the Yaris Verso. Okay. Uh, Yaris is our new small car that goes on sale in April. And this is a sort of mini MPV version of it uh, that we'll probably bring out towards the end of the year. So it's not a concept vehicle, it is something that's very likely to go into production. It's very close to what we'll probably put on sale, yeah. The interior of it is quite wild, isn't it? It's like space age. I mean, we know the new millennium's coming, but it's really wild. Do you think that may actually make it into the production version? Well, one of the key things about it is to make as much practical use of the space, because it's obviously quite a small vehicle. And we've talked to a lot of people, especially young families, and the things that children need to take with them when they're a baby and when they're older and they've got bikes and things, they need a lot of flexibility. So we've tried to build as much of that into the, the Verso as we can. The most important thing is the rear seats which fold completely away under the front seat. So you don't have to leave them behind, you've always got them, but you've also got a big flat load area that you can get bikes and God knows what else in. So it's versatility that is, is the key with Absolutely. it really? Absolutely. What about the engine range? What, what will we powering it? We haven't said it, but it will most likely be a 1.3, which would be about 90 brake horsepower. Okay. Um, um, does this mean that we may see other derivatives from the Yaris? Because it's, I mean, everybody seems to be using platforms for so many things, so could, have we got others to come on that? Well, that, I mean, that's really why we've shown it here. This would literally just put Yaris, the main three-door and five-door on sale. And we just wanted to show that it's not that's not the end of the story. There are other things we can do with it. And this is just one of them. When we showed the original concept of Yaris, we also showed a little sports coupe. So you never know, that might come shortly as well. And you wouldn't tell us even if you knew I, you? I could tell you, but then, you know, I couldn't, couldn't possibly confirm it. <laughs> so what about the Yaris? Are we likely to see another engine in addition to the one litre that goes on sale? Yeah, I, mean, I think that's, that's more than likely. And again, that'll probably be before the end of the year. The, the market shows that 70% of the cars in that sector, which is a Fiesta Corsa size, are of the horsepower that we've got with the one litre. So the bulk of the sales are in there. But also there are more performance oriented vehicles in there and we want to base part of that as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, that's all in part one of Motor Week. Lots more from Geneva coming up after the break. Imagine you're a designer and somebody says, hey, go mate, this is the 406. We've made 730,000 of these and we're bored. It needs freshening up, changing. 
Yeah, right. What do you do? You move it a little bit? Why don't you move it a little bit too far? Nobody buys them anymore. Under those circumstances, with a car that sells in that kind of volume and is as important as the 406 is to Peugeot, you don't make radical changes unless you have to. In fact, it's at the front where the most radical changes have taken place with this. The grille has been changed, the headlamps changed quite comprehensively. Take a walk along the side and look at the flanks, look at the car in profile, and you'll see there's very little change. At the back, there's new lights, there's a new boot lid, and it's all well, very subtle changes. One thing Peugeot have definitely done in their move, perhaps to give it a bit more of an upmarket feel, is rediscovered the joys of chrome. It's down the side, it's on the inside, it's adorning in subtle ways just about anywhere they can find to put it. Overall, it's still a pleasing looking car. Perhaps this gives it a little more aggression at the front end. We'll wait and see if these subtle changes have the desired effect for Peugeot and keep the pace going that it has with the 406 in the past. I can't remember the last time Vauxhall came up with a decent sports car. Can you? Well, they've surprised us here at the Geneva show with this new concept called the Speedster. Rather good, isn't it? Apart from the colour, anyway. It's been developed in conjunction with Lotus at Vauxhall's technical centre at Russellheim in Germany. It has an all-aluminium lightweight body, and this thing should go like stink. You get a choice of 1.8 or 2.2-litre engines when the car no doubt goes into production, hopefully in the year 2000. The mid-engine Speedster features a new aluminium Ecotec four-cylinder motor which will be produced in Kaiserslautern in Germany. The lightweight four-valve unit is to be offered in a range of engine sizes from 1.8 to 2.2 litres. It's been designed to deliver strong performance with low fuel consumption and further reduced exhaust emissions. The 2.2 litre version in the Speedster produces maximum power of 147 brake horsepower with a top speed of around 137 miles per hour and 0 to 60 time in less than six seconds. What do you get if you cross an off-roader, a city car and add a dash of estate? The answer is this, the Honda HRV. It's a totally new type of car and I've been to Barcelona to drive it to find out just what it's like. In a world that's packed with every kind of car you can imagine, Honda have decided to invent a new one for us. They've called it the HRV. So what exactly is it? Take two parts compact city car, add an equal measure of sports utility vehicle, throw in a large pinch of hatchback, estate and four-wheel drive. Blend well and garnish with plenty of accessories. There you have it, Honda's recipe for creating a brand new concept of vehicle that they hope will send the youngsters wild. Yes, Honda have realised that not many young people buy their cars, so they're owning the HRV at the Dinkies. Double income, no kids yet, or the sinkies. Just the same, but only one income. Well, tempted or not, what do you actually get for your money? Well, this is the only version of the HRV on sale yet. It's the 1.6 and it comes with four-wheel drive. Now, this 1.6 engine is extremely economical and also produces very low emissions. It's just under 14 grand and you get a choice of manual or a CVT, which is Honda's automatic gearbox. The HRV comes with the high levels of spec that we know and we love in a Honda. Things like power steering, air conditioning, dual airbags and a full electrics package all come as standard on this vehicle. Spending some time in the HRV makes you realise that it is actually a very clever optical illusion. Those of us familiar with Honda's work of course know they're a solid sensible company who take their technology and their cars very, very seriously. Quite terrifying then to read the word funky in the HRV's press pack. Even more frightening the words urbane, cool and futuristic. Personally I reckon the HRV looks less catwalk cool and more tarts handbag. You'll find alloys, flared arches, spoilers, two-tone upholstery, two-tone interior, lots and lots of bright blue dials Inside, there's loads of room for passengers and all their stuff. There are so many cubby holes and storage spaces in this vehicle that you're absolutely guaranteed to forget where you put your sunglasses. Oh well. Now, Honda are one of those companies well known for their technological advances and they haven't let us down on the HRV. They've come up with something new. The removable ashtray, voila! It simply pops out of its position 
and can be replaced in any one of the five cup holders you'll find in the HRV. Very clever. Without a doubt, the HRV is going to make plenty of new friends. It's quirky, it's great fun to drive, and of course, it's a Honda, so everything will work every single day. But I've got to say that although we know we should buy a car that's fun, sensible, and extremely reliable, I'm afraid that Faint Heart never won Fur Maiden, because what I really want is a car that's bad, that's bold, and that makes my pulse race. Oh well, better keep on searching. Funny thing, nations and the difference between them. The Japanese are restrained and quiet and understated, whereas us Europeans are supposedly more brash, louder and more outgoing. Why is it then that in the UK we drive the Charisma and in Japan they get this? The Lancer. This is the Mitsubishi Lancer Evolution 6 and it's the best piece of hooligan kit you will find. 276 brake horsepower from a 2 litre turbo engine. It makes it the best thing cross country you'll ever experience and it might look like something out of a futuristic war movie. But don't be fooled, these are not plastic toy stick on bits, they're here to do a real job. Starting from the back, that rear spoiler really does increase downforce. In fact, it alters to do its job even better as the car increases speed. If you move along to these enormous OZ alloys, look inside and you'll see a set of Brembo brakes that will bring this whole thing to a halt quicker than the Vickers daughter on prom night. At the front, even the number plate gives way for this enormous intake to get air into that engine as quickly as possible. It works so hard that it's only 2 litre, but people have reported less than 14 mpg. In image terms, cars like this could be seen as perhaps the modern day equivalent of a big rorty motorbike. But at about 29k through special importers in the UK, it's more likely to be found in the hands of an accountant than it is the Fonz. Well, that's all from the 1999 Geneva Motor Show. We've certainly had a lot of fun. We have. Things get back to normal, though, on Motor Week next week, so there'll be a whole lot of cars to look out for then. And the next big show is Frankfurt in September, which, of course, you'll see on Motor Week. So for now, another motor show has come and gone. Bye from Geneva.